you have Bibles or if you something you're taking notes with, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. <coughs> Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 25. The Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 25. Starting at verse 1. Um, we're starting a a teaching today on uh, the title of, for those who are taking notes, is Make Ready, Preparing for the Second Coming of Jesus Christ. And one of my, one of my greatest burdens um, as a minister of the gospel is, uh, is to see the people that we pastor um, succeed. And one of the ways that I know that success comes is as you are, have find your life grounded in biblical truth. And, um, you know, I don't believe in a gospel that, um, that we hear and that entertains us but doesn't change us. And uh, I have seen too many Christians um, here, in the, you know, here in our city, in the U.S., around the world that, um, that live the same life over and over. And I'm just like, how is that possible uh, when we serve the God of the impossible? It just makes no sense to me, and so, and so one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that I know that really helps to ground people um, is doctrine or theology. Now I know that um, the term theology or theological terms is not something that many, um, you know, many Christians may be familiar with. Um, a lot of times, is you know those those doctrines or those teachings. <coughs> or those official terms are relegated <clears throat> to institutions of higher learning. And, uh, but I just think that that, um, that, that is a crime uh, because you need to know the God that you say that you serve and you can't know him apart from, your, apart from his word. <clears throat> Amen? And, uh, and doctrine, which is just a, it's a, a Greek word that means teaching, you know, you need good doctrine. All of us need good doctrine. And one of the primary reasons we need good doctrine is so that you are not blown about by every wind of doctrine. Because there are things that blow through the church and blow through culture and blow through society that if you're not grounded in biblical truth, you'll be like, oh, that sounds like truth or that sounds good. And you'll latch a hold on it, latch a hold to it, and don't know that that thing um, came from the pits of hell and was designed to, you know, confuse you and, and to sweep you out of God's kingdom. And so that's why it's so important that I don't care who, who teaches you, your pastor, your bishop, your apostle, your friend, your auntie, grandmama, whoever, you know, you've got to know God for yourself. Because I have learned, I, you know what, I've learned that, that people can be, in, they can be uh, that people can know church and not know God. People can know everything about their pastor but not know nothing about Jesus. Especially in our context or in our, you know, predominantly African-American communities, just like we have, a, you know, this, this great uh, attribute of loyalty, but that loyalty can lead us into bondage if we're not careful. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And so, you know, one of the things that is, um, you know, that is a reality that everyone needs to know, or even if you know it, you need to understand it, is that the same way that Jesus came is the same way that he plans to return. Amen? And the reason why that is important to us, or should be important, <coughs> is because when he returns, he's planning on returning to uh, get some people, to bring some folk with him. And, and, and if you don't know him, or you think you know him, right, you can be left behind or left out of the equation uh, like these, uh, these five virgins in this story that we're about to read in Matthew 25. So let's take a look at this real quick. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> this is a parable, and you know that Jesus often taught in parables. A parable was, is simply a natural story that illustrates spiritual truth. 
a lot of people in Jesus' day and even in our time, especially during his time, the Bible says that spiritual things aren't discerned by the natural man. A lot of things go over people's head because they need to be spiritually discerned. Like, it don't make sense to love your enemy. Now it makes sense. We want to beat our enemy down. Shoot them, cut them, stab them. Come on, stab tires. Come on, I know y'all in the house. Scrap, key their car up, all that kind of stuff. That's what you want. You want to exact revenge when someone does you wrong your own self. You don't want to trust that vengeance is the Lord's. He's promised to repay. Amen? And so, you know, so when you talk about love your enemies, bless those that curse you, pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you, that is a different kind and type of statement. Hallelujah. Or if somebody, um, you know, you know, he said, you know, Jesus said this, uh, you know, and, and it wasn't, he didn't say it in jest. He said that, hey, if somebody slaps you or punches you, he said, turn and give him the other cheek. Hallelujah. Now, y'all know our mamas and daddies and whoever, they ain't raised us that way. We was taught that, listen, if you go outside and you get into a fight and you get beat up, you get, into, you get beat up twice that day. You got that whooping and you're going to come home and get a whooping. So, listen, now, we was most scared of our mom and daddy. Like, even if I don't like fighting, I am scared to get a whooping when I get home. So, I'm going to listen. You might know karate, but I know crazy. And so we're going we're gonna to fight. We're going to do our best. Or listen, if we lose, we're going to listen. At least put up a good showing to have whoever was responsible for raising us, uh, you know, think that we won. Because, you know, most of us, we was raised in the switch generation. You say switch now, people think you're talking about a game. You're talking about the Nintendo Switch. We ain't talking about the Nintendo Switch. That's part of the problem. Was raised in a time where they would, your grandmother, mother, whoever, they would tell you, hey, go out to that bush, that tree out there, and go get a switch. They make you get your own weapon that they're about to do you in with. And it only took me one time to come back with a switch about this big. I like, just like, I thought you wanted this, Grandma. And if they get up off that rocking chair in silence and don't say nothing, you are in trouble. And they walked to that thing, they would go and get two or three of them look like tree limbs. And then what would they do next? They would peel them down. And then what would they do? Braid them up. My God, help me today. <coughs> we ain't want that smoke, okay, man? Hallelujah. I was one of them kids that <clears throat> I looked at other folk, I was like, okay, he getting, he getting, he getting really, really beat. I don't want that for my life, so let me, let me try to be obedient. Amen? <clears throat> and we don't, I don't want you to, to, uh, you know, to get beat or live in a place of defeat in your life. And that comes as a result of y'all really understanding a God and his word. So let's look at this. Matthew 25, uh, verse 1. Are we all there? <clears throat> it says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, and five were what? They were foolish. And those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil <clears throat> in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and they slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, <clears throat> Behold, the bridegroom is coming. It's time to go out to meet him. And then all those virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell oil and buy it for yourselves. And while they went to buy, <clears throat> the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Whew. 
So Jesus, as I was alluding to before, Jesus often taught parables, in parables, natural stories that illustrate spiritual truth so that people could really grasp uh, what he was teaching or the concepts uh, behind the thoughts that he was sharing or the teachings that the teaching that he was disseminating among whatever crowd that he was ministering to or in front of at that time. And one of the important things to understand about any kind of text that you read um, in the Bible is, uh, is the context that the Word of God is shared in. And the context is not just what, like what we just read. Um, it also takes into account who was the author, right? Who was the author? Who was the audience? Who were they writing to or talking to as they were communicating um, you know, what they were, you know, what they were attempting to communicate. And then also the context surrounding it. You know, what precedes the passage that you just read? What comes after the passage that you just read? That's called the immediate context. And then you also have like context where it's set in uh, the chapter, the book, uh, you know, the testament that it's in, and then the wider, um, what we call the canon of scripture, which is the Old and the New Testament combined. Amen. So in order for you to really understand certain aspects about God and what he's communicating to us, you have to remember, uh, uh, you know, this rule when you study that context is everything. Amen? You ever heard the con the concept where they talk about a real estate, you know, the top three rules in real estate is what? Location, location, location. Top three in Bible study is context, context, and context. Because if you take things out of context, um, you can really do damage to people's lives. You can hurt yourself and you can also hurt other people. Amen? And so when you, we don't have time to look at this this morning, uh, but if you look at the surrounding context of this particular passage that we just read, the passage that, the even the part, big part of the chapter that preceded it, Matthew 24, um, and then uh, after, you know, verses 14 on down, you will see that there is a, re a resounding theme <clears throat> that Jesus is, is, um, is talking about and teaching to the people, his disciples and the people that are around him. Matthew 24 is a very famous passage, you know, among certain scholars and theologians called the Olivet Discourse. You may know it. You may not know it by that name, but you know it by when Jesus' disciples said, hey, Lord, you know, tell us what's going to be, um, you know, like signs of your coming. Like, you know, what, can you give us kind of like some tips or tools or insight? Like, how do we know? Um, you know, when you're going to return, and you probably know where well, you hear about wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and famines in various places. And then he said that these are the beginning of birth pains, but the end is not near yet. And right, people will be deceived and they're, you know, false people will raise up and, you know, you know, claim to be the Messiah. So you might be familiar with that. But what he was talking about, there's been a, a lot of debate. Was he talking about him coming the second time or was he or was he talking about um, you know something that that immediately uh, applied to them in the first in their first century context, right? And, uh, and I don't have time to go into all the history and stuff of that this morning, how the temple was destroyed and all of that, and and all of those kind of things. So a lot of people debate, you know, about well, who is he talking about? It wasn't really talking about end times, like you know, because when we hear our Western ears hear the last days, we automatically think of the this doctrine of what they call last things, and does anyone know the official term for that? It starts with an E. What? Eschatology. Comes from a Greek word, eschatos, which means last or final things. And just like there was a beginning of things in Genesis, Genesis means beginning, there is going to be an end of things as well. Amen? Like, for example, a lot of people think that, um, that, when, that when you die, and your final resting place is heaven. Do you know where you're going to live? If you're in Christ and once, you know, once, uh, you know, the entire story of Christ and this kingdom has been consummated, do you know where your final destination is going to be? It's going to be the earth, not heaven. Heaven is a temporary holding place like hell is a temporary holding place because those who die without Christ, their final resting place is the lake of fire. Amen? Right? So we, we need to know this stuff. You, you need to know it so you, you know, you don't have to be an expert in it, but you need to be educated concerning it. 
Amen. So that if a person asks you something about your faith, you don't just say, well, a bleed, a bleed, a bleed. That's all, folks. No, you need to be able to say something <laughs> intelligent. The Bible calls it uh, apologetics. You should be able to defend your faith. So when crazy stuff happens in your culture, your society you live in, you're not swept away in the culture. Hallelujah. Like I know it's popular. They talk about, you know, is, you know, is, is, is there a heaven for a G, a heaven for a gangster? No, there's not. I know that, you know, preacher, whatever, they ain't popular to talk about hell no more or whatever. No, it's not no, no heaven for no gangster. You can't live like it's no God your whole life and then expect that God is going to receive you in. It don't work like that. It don't work like that. Hallelujah. You can't, listen, you can't live, and we'll, we'll take a look at this. You can't just live recklessly and lawlessly and expect that there are no repercussions behind that. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. There will be people, listen, I hope to God not, but the reality is there'll be people in this church and the churches all over the world that when Christ returns a second time, you're going to be left behind. Because you think you know God and you don't know him. You know church or you have a semblance of God in your brain, but you were never fully converted or transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, yeah, you can't be judging nobody. You know, oh, Jesus. Is that something wrong with you, church? Is wrong with you, Christian? You can't be judging. You be just, just a judge and judge. And you just be judging. Just. Listen, I would rather be judged by man than judged by God. Y'all know the Bible says that judgment begins where? In the house of God. And the Bible says to judge yourself so that you don't be so that you don't be judged. If you do what you're supposed to be doing, God won't have to send nobody to get in your business. And he's not doing it to be angry or aggressive or mad. It's because he loves you. And while this ark is being built, he's trying to make sure that there's room for you on the boat. Hallelujah. And that your mind is not, is not manipulated and molested by the spirit of this age. That would tell you that, listen, you can act and live any kind of way and still make it in. That ain't true, Angela. That ain't true at all. Hallelujah. It says fornicators won't make it in. Liars, thieves, drunkards, right? The cowardly. You have no place in the kingdom of God. It's not that God didn't give you an opportunity, right? to toe the line and to accept him as Savior and Lord. But we did our own thing, Cheryl. And then expect for God to come and render mercy at the last minute like them five foolish virgins that we read about. One of the things that, that gets people tripped up more than anything is Christ, not his coming, his delay. Like we read in the story, it said that the bridegroom delayed his delay, his, his, you know, they thought he was coming, but his thing was delayed, so they slept. Oh, he ain't coming back. No, I haven't been hearing this since the 80s. He coming back. Folk thought he was coming back in 89. Folk thought he was coming back in 92. So come back or whatever. Can I tell you something? Scripture says no one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven. Only the Father knows, but I'm telling you what, he is coming back. And he's coming for a church without spot and without wrinkle. So when you look at the context of this, uh, of this passage we just read um, around surrounding it, before it and after it, yeah, the Olivet Discourse is Matthew 24, the second coming of Christ, Matthew 24, 27 to 31, the parable of the fig tree, the days of Noah. He said that, that when the Son of Man comes, like it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be with the coming of the Son of Man. So people were marrying and giving in marriage. People were just living their lives. They was living their best life in Noah's day and had no idea that judgment had already been rendered and that, and that, and that, uh, and that everyone on earth besides Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives were about to perish. 
And God promised us, thank God, that he would never again destroy the earth by water. But there is a judgment that's coming, and judgment is not for the believer. It shouldn't be for the believer. The Bible calls in Revelation, I think it's 22, the great white throne judgment. And it sounds nice because it's a white throne. But you don't want that judgment. You want the judgment seat of Christ where he judges you for the works, good or bad, that you did or did not do while you in your body. You had all them skills and talents and intelligence and abilities and all that kind of stuff, and you only use it for yourself. You never use it to build my kingdom. You never use it to build my house. That's our judgment for those who are in Christ. The great white throne judgment and for those who die outside of Christ. You don't want that judgment. None of us do. Amen. So the days of Noah, the parable of the two servants, parable of ten versions, what we just read, parable of the talents, judgment of the Gentiles, all of that is found in the context preceding what we read and coming after what we read. Now, it's, it should be obvious to anybody that how much time Jesus spent sharing all of that information meant that it had some significance and importance to him. And if it was important to him then, it should be important to us now. Amen. Let me give you these three, three takeaways from this story, the parable of the ten virgins. The first takeaway is that Christ will return unexpectedly, without warning. Now, I don't have time, and maybe I'll have time uh, next week uh, or subsequent weeks to go into um, what we call the Hebraic or the Jewish calendar uh, to show you because you, I have learned, and I'm not an expert in this, and I'm not saying this is exactly what's going to happen because obviously no one knows but the Bible says in a couple of different times, no one knows the day or the hour, but it didn't say you don't know the season. And there's a Hebrew word for the feast of the Lord. Y'all know it's seven feasts or festivals. It's holidays that the Jewish uh, people live by. And, uh, and y'all know them as y'all know the first one. It's three spring feasts, one summer feast, and three fall feasts. Y'all know that? And the first one is called Pesach or Passover. Pesach in Hebrew is the Passover. The one right next to it is his twin is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Right, y'all, y'all, y'all know this? Y'all with me? Y'all, y'all tracking? Well, listen here, I'm like, oh, y'all okay? <laughs> Hello. Right, three spring feasts, one summer, three fall. Now, this is just what I have... Uh, deduced or surmised as a result of studying, looking into this stuff over the years. So the feasts or festivals of the Lord, they're holidays, holy days, holidays. They had, a, they had and still have a lot of significance and meaning um, amongst Jewish culture. And these were festivals that they had to do certain things. They had to keep them. It wasn't optional. Amen? And, and I'll just tell you this because, you know, for the sake of time, I don't have the time to get into it this morning. Um, but uh, there is no way, in my opinion, this ain't Bible, this is just my opinion, there is no way that something of great significance would happen on four of the seven feasts and the other three feasts be left unfulfilled. Amen? Y'all know Christ was our Passover lamb. Y'all know Passover came out of the story of the Exodus, right? Y'all know that? Y'all tracking with me? Passover, right? Feast of Unleavened Bread came out of the story of the Exodus. They were you know, given instruction, you know, remove all leaven from your house. Leaven is symbolic of sin. He said, put no leavening agents in your bread because you're going to have to make, you're going to have to eat in haste because the, your deliverance is going to come instantaneously and you won't have time to go through the natural process of making bread like you normally do. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Passover, they were taught they had to consume the entire Passover lamb, so on and so forth. So Jesus, the the communion, the 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 uh, table of the Lord came out of the Passover, um, Passover, whatever you want to call it. It came out of that. When y'all see the picture of the Last Supper, they weren't having communion. They were, they were, uh, they were keeping the Passover dinner. It was a, it's called a Seder meal. Y'all with me? <laughs> Come on, Jesus. Ah! Oh, Jesus. Ah! It's called, a Seder, it's called a Seder meal that consisted of uh, courses of consuming lamb, bread, dip, bitter herbs, wine. Y'all remember when Jesus was getting mad at, at, at uh, Peter, Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said he was praying one hour, 
And, and why was he getting mad? You know why they kept falling asleep? Because they was full and drunk. I'm not lying. Listen, they don't drink. They were drinking fermented wine. They were drinking wine. Then they weren't drinking juice like we drink. So Peter couldn't, because he was full on lamb and liquor, as they, were, as they had just left the Seder meal. You know how when you be a fool. With no liquor, just lamb, because you just get full. You know how you do. You catch the itis, right? And so they had these things, the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits. It's when Christ got back up out of the grave. The Bible calls them said the first fruits of those that died or that slept, that was resurrected again. The Feast of Pentecost or Shavuot, that was when uh, the, the church, the Holy Spirit descended, right? Y'all remember, you know, Jesus died, he was buried, he got up out of the grave, he was resurrected. And let me ask you this, class, did he immediately go to heaven after his resurrection? How long was he on earth after he, res he was resurrected? How long? 40 days. Come on, I just heard y'all saying some other stuff. This is why we need this, my God, help me today. 40 days, he's walking around with holes in his hands and in his side and in his feet, teaching his disciples about things that pertain to the kingdom of God, the scripture says. And almost on that last day, he said, listen, I'm going away. I got to go away. The last instruction he gave was, here, y'all stay in this upper room in Jerusalem. Don't depart until the, the gift of the Father comes upon you. And that gift of the Father was the person of the Holy Spirit. And so he left for 40, 40 days he was here. Then on that 40th day, he ascended and was sat down at God's right hand. Ten days, they had a 10-day prayer meeting, right? 40 plus 10 is what? That's where we get Pentecost from. Penta. Penta is a five-sided. Y'all understand that? That's where we get Pentecost from. It's, it's a Hebrew uh, festival called Shavuot. Uh, but thank God we call Pentecostals and not Shavuotals. The Shabbat would sound a little crazy. So something significant happened on all four of those holidays. And you probably have heard this um, when it said that when Jesus returns the second time, what is going to be a signal or a sign of his return? How will you know? What's going to happen? Say it. Somebody says something, he's going to come, right? He, he's going to come out of the sky, and what's going to happen? How are you going to know? You say what? A trumpet is going to blow. Now, this, let, just, just track with me here. A trumpet is going to blow, right? So this is just my, this is just warm. Trumpet is going to blow. The three feasts in the spring, something, you know, he was the Passover lamb. He was also the unleavened bread. First fruits, he got up. He's the first fruit of those that slept. Then Shavuot, the summer festival, because y'all know that came uh, what f it came six weeks, I think. The count this, this thing called the counting of the omen came about however many uh, after Passover, and when when the Holy Spirit poured out and the church was officially born. And then there's these three fall feasts. Well, you know what is the first feast of the three fall feasts? It's called the Feast of Trumpets. It's the, the trumpet. It's not a trumpet like we think an instrument. It's a ram's horn, a shofar. And it's something that has been in Jewish lore and culture, y'all, for centuries. The Feast of the Trumpets, announcing, you know, that something is about to transpire or to happen. Now, I could be wrong, okay? Y'all hear me? So don't walk out of here saying that I said that this is the Bible. This is not. This is warm. Because the Bible says that no one knows the day nor the hour. Nobody, only the Father. Not even Jesus knows it. But I believe, right, just based on my studies, that I believe that he's going to return in a fall season at some point. Because there's too many what we call dinks, where the trumpet is going to sound and he's going to crack the sky. And the first feast out of the three fall feasts that haven't been fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets. And so what does that mean? It's, it means that regardless of whether he returns in the fall or he returns tonight, that you have to be ready. Because can I just tell you that prophetically, nothing else has to happen uh, before he returns. Nothing else has to happen. You know, like John the Baptist, before he came the first time, John the Baptist had to be born. He had to be a forerunner. He had to come. Nothing has to happen for him to return. He could come at any moment. Hallelujah. Amen.
Let's stand. I'll, I'll fin finish. We'll dive into this next week. Praise the Lord. One of the things that I think is really important for us to understand is that if it's like, um, you know, like he said, it's in the days of Noah. So we know that, you know, if you believe the Bible, I believe the Bible. I don't know if you believe it or not, but I believe it. I don't believe that it was fiction. So if you believe that, that only eight people survived and whatever animals during Noah's day or time, well, God doesn't want, Scripture says he wants anyone to perish. Right? So it's our job. I believe that the ark uh, of safety is the church of the Lord, is the family of God, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we have to get as many people into the ark as possible. Not local churches. Local churches, they need to be a part of a local church. But I believe that the ark is Christ in this hour, right? And that people need to be uh, brought onto the boat, so to speak. So that when judgment and chaos and devastation and destruction and all of this stuff comes, that, that they won't lose their mind and be outside of the boat because they'd be in the ark of safety, which is Jesus himself. Amen? And so, um, and so it's something that we, you know, when you, when you come across people, family members, friends, coworkers, loved ones, um, I know that it can be very um, easy for us to kind of just bypass certain people and not, uh, build a relationship with them, not share the gospel with them, um, all of that kind of stuff. You know, for whatever reason, we're afraid of rejection. I tried before, just whatever. But the Bible says this, y'all, that the harvest is plentiful, it's bountiful, but the labors are few, right? People, you would be surprised if you engage in spiritual conversations with people, right? You don't got to be spooky. You ain't got to jump and be like, hey, how you doing? And then, you know, whip something out your pocket. That's weird. You know what I have found to be the best, just in my opinion, relational evangelism. Because when people like you, and they and listen, people like you, they work with you, they can have different beliefs with you. You invite them to church, you invite them to a small group or whatever, they'll come. Right? Or say, hey, you know, let me have a conversation with you about your, about your belief, your spiritual life or whatever. They will entertain you in conversation simply out of respect for you. Because you have relationship, you got you have you built relational currency into the relationship. Amen. And so don't um, don't overlook people that are uh, around us every day. I buried a young man yesterday. I, some of y'all know that I do work for funeral homes in the city, and they, you know, typically I get called if they don't have a, um, a, a minister in their family. And typically it's always a non-believer, non-believing family. And I buried a young man yesterday. He's in his 30s, uh, died of an overdose, and uh, had been addicted to for years and and uh, died of an overdose. I got, you know, wind of a family that used to be a part of this congregation for a number of years uh, that I was told just this weekend that uh, it was a kid that was in our youth group and in our church, he got murdered uh, this week right here in Cincinnati, right? And so I'm just like, man, wow, right? The scripture says that life is like a vapor. You'll be here today and you'll be gone tomorrow. Hallelujah. So we have to live every moment like it's our last and not just allow people and life and while you're doing all your other stuff, building your business and your empire and all that, you do all those things, but don't do that at the expense of, of folk not coming to know Christ. Hallelujah. Don't do that at your own expense of you not knowing Christ. Hallelujah. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, this time, this sobering moment. God, where I just believe that you are tugging and pulling upon the strings of our hearts, we ask that, um, Lord, if there is anyone that you've spoken to, even today, that, uh, uh, that you're dealing with their heart concerning their own eternal, eternal fate and state, um, you know, that they may be confused or thinking that they are in good graces with you simply by uh, you know, whatever they may think. <clears throat> Lord, I just pray that you pull every blinder off of us. Remove every veil from our minds. Remove every scales from our hearts and our eyes and allow us to see you in the way that you've called us to see you. Experience you in a way that you've called us to experience you. We bless you and ask these things in Jesus' name.
Now, listen, if you're here today and, you know, like, you know, and you're just like, hey, what am I, what am I supposed to do, you know, with this? Listen, if you don't know the Lord, the very first thing you knew, you need to repent of your sins. The Bible says if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The very best decision I ever made in my life was to follow Jesus. Amen. My father shared the gospel with me for years, y'all, and I just was dismissive and wasn't trying to hear him, thought he was tripping or whatever until I came into a situation. And I said, man, what if he's right? What if he's not tripping? What if he, what, what if, what if he is telling me the truth? Amen. And I'm telling you, November 17th, 1997 was my born day, my spiritually being born again day. Uh, I was in the Milwaukee County Jail, 949 North 9th Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Listen, no fireworks went off. The angel didn't say, oh, and come down. Right? It was nothing, nothing magical happened. I didn't even pray, you know, you know what they call the sinner's prayer. I just said, God, listen, I don't know if you're real or not. I don't know. I didn't grow up in church like some of you all have or whatever. I said, I don't know if you're real, but if you are, my dad says you are, and I trust my dad. And I've seen change in my dad's life. Even though I don't understand it, I said, I've seen him change and positive change. And so, listen, if you're real like he says you are, I need you to show me. Because it's one thing for somebody to tell me, but I need to know it and know you for my own self. And so, because I'm in jail and all these black guys around me, they telling me that, you know, listen, Christianity is a white man's religion. You got, you got to be a Muslim and follow Allah. I said, I don't know what's true. I don't know if that's true or what my dad is. I don't know. So I need you to show me. And I woke up the next day, y'all, and I was different. I could feel a difference. Listen, and you know what I felt? I felt peace. I was like, listen, I was 22 years old, facing 15 to 25 years in prison. I'd had a, some really close friends that had been murdered, uh, you know, one just a few months uh, prior, one a year or so prior to that or whatever. Listen, I was going nowhere fast. And I said, man, this is not what I planned for my life when we're young. And you say, hey, when I grow up, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an NBA player. Nobody says, hey, when I grow up, I want to be a felon. Hey, I want to be pregnant out of wedlock. Hey, I want to be an addict. Nobody says that, but you know what? It happens all the time. And so I woke up on November 17th, and I was changed. Y'all, I listened. I was behind bars, but I was so free, I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, my God. I could feel, and I know now I didn't have verbiage for it then, but I could feel the scripture coming alive in me, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. It don't make sense that I'm facing 25 years in prison, but I got peace, Anthony. I said, listen, K Sarah, Sarah, wherever it will be, will be. I know that at some point I've gotten myself into this predicament. I don't really know God like that. I'm not going to beg him to get me out of this predicament, but I know one day I'm going to come home. And whenever that day is, I'm going to do something with my life. That's what I knew. I had peace and I was different. And then I began to learn the ways of the Lord. That's why prison ministry is so important. A little evangelist, a black African-American evangelist in her 60s named Evangelist Catherine Sidney would come to the jail every Sunday night and she would teach us the word of God. All us knucklehead, hothead, listen, we, you know, all of that stuff and would teach us God's word. And I would grow from faith to faith Level to level, glory to glory. God sent people my way, even while I was incarcerated. Chaplains and, you know, something, Brother Warren, God is going to do something with your life. We don't know what it is, but he's going to do something with your life. And I say, Chaplain Raleigh, I agree. Chaplain Lavasser, I agree. I don't know what it is either, but I know it's something. I can feel it. <laughs> and I'm different from how I was six months ago. Hallelujah. And that difference was the blood of Jesus. The Paschal, the sacrificial lamb came and washed all my sins away. Hallelujah. Gave me purpose and identity for the first time in my life. I know I ain't have to live confused no more. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, you don't have to do that either. God shows no respect to persons. What he did for me then, he will do for you today. But you have to accept the gift that's being presented to you. 
Hallelujah. So if you're here and you need prayer because you don't know the Lord, you've never had your sins forgiven, I want you to come down and have one of these people to pray for you. Amen. And if there is something else that you need prayer for and you would like to come down and have one of our altar team members pray for you, they can do that as well. But you just specify and you let them know the reason why you're coming down. Amen. And let me pray and dismiss. Father, thank you Lord, for our time together today. I just, uh, just, just give you thanks, honor, and glory. And just pray that you would bless us indeed. Um, Lord God, continue to enlarge the places of our understanding. Continue to cause your face, uh, continue to be gracious to us and cause your face, God, to shine down upon us. We honor you and bless you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.